What's riding a jet ski good for? Well, it's fun. It's good for pleasure. What's pleasure good for? Nothing, nothing else. Pleasure is just good. Okay, so we're going to start this course by talking about a moral theory called utilitarianism. And the philosopher that we read for today is one of the original most famous proponents of utilitarianism. His name is Jeremy Bentham. So what is the theory? Which actions does it say are morally good and which actions are morally bad? Bentham tells us right at the beginning of the reading for today. Bentham gives us a principle called the principle of utility. The principle is going to be a rule or a set of instructions. It's going to be a rather general, vague rule in some way, but it's going to be a set of instructions for how to act. And if you follow these instructions, then you're going to be acting morally well. You're going to be doing the morally right things. And if you don't follow these instructions, then you are at risk for doing the morally bad stuff. Here's what it says. The principle of utility is, quote, that principle which approves or disapproves of every action whatsoever, according to the tendency it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question. Okay, so what does that mean? The principle, it's going to be a rule or set of instructions, which approves or disapproves of every action whatsoever. So for any action that anyone does, or any action that anyone could potentially or theoretically do, this principle is going to tell you whether it's a good action or a bad action. It's going to classify every possible action. And the criteria that it's going to use is the well, according to the tendency, it appears, wait, what's it? It. The tendency, it, the action, the tendency that the action appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question. That is, if you want to know if any action is good or bad, morally speaking, well, then you need to see whether that action increases, augments, or decreases, diminishes, whether it increases or decreases the happiness of the relevant people. And we're going to talk in a minute about who the relevant people are, right? But this is a principle that says that the moral rightness or wrongness of actions is determined by the effect that those actions have on happiness. Here is a sort of more general statement of utilitarianism, and this is the one that we're going to use throughout the course. Okay, so here's our statement of utilitarianism that we're going to operate with. Utilitarianism is the theory that we are morally required to do whatever produces the greatest total of pleasure minus pain. And we're talking about the greatest total for everyone in the universe, for all of the people or maybe all of the creatures that can experience pleasure and pain. That's the theory. Okay. If we're going to assess this theory, we're gonna, if we're going to be able to tell whether it's a good theory or a bad theory, whether it accurately captures the real moral fabric of the universe or whatever, then we're going to need to understand the sort of sub-theories that this theory is made up out of. So now I'm going to go through those. The first sub-theory is called hedonism. Okay, hedonism is the theory that what is good for each of us as an end is pleasure and what is bad for each of us as an end is pain. Okay, there's a lot here that needs to be explained. Let's start with this phrase, as an end. So. Something can be good for a person, or something can be good, either as a means or as an end. So if something is good as a means, then it's good for getting something else. It's good as a way of acquiring some other thing, and that other thing is good, and the first thing is only good because the first thing gets you 
that second other thing, right? So, for example, when I ask students what something that's good as a means is, the example that I always get, and it's a good example, is money. Here, here's some money, right? Money is good as a means because, well, money is only good for spending. You spend money to get stuff. Just having the piece of paper or the coin or the numbers in your electronic bank account, just having that isn't good by itself. It's not good as an end. Something is good as an end if it's good by itself, just to have it, not because it gets you something else. But money is only good for getting other things. So what's money good for? Well, it's good for getting coffee. Okay, is coffee good as an end? No, coffee is only good for some other stuff that coffee gets you, like it gets you energy, right? Coffee is good also as a means for staying awake. What's staying awake good for? Well, staying awake is good for studying. What's studying good for? Studying is good for getting a good score on the LSATs. What's getting a good score on the LSATs good for? Well, it's good for getting into law school. What's getting into law school good for? Well, in the long run, it's good for getting a big fancy law job and making lots of money. So now we're back to money. And again, what is money good for? Well, money, another thing that money is good for, if you get enough of it because you went to law school, right? Another thing that money is good for is jet skis. Here's a jet ski. There, that's the jet ski, right? What's a jet ski good for? Again, all of these all of these things are only good as a means. A jet ski is good for riding the jet ski. It's not just good for, you know, leaving it there in a, in a room by itself to collect dust. A jet ski is only good for riding. What's riding a jet ski good for? Well, it's fun. It's good for pleasure. It's good for happiness. That's what riding a jet ski is good for. What's pleasure good for? Nothing, nothing else. Pleasure is just good. Pleasure or happiness, that's the thing, so says the hedonist at least, that's the thing that's good as an end. It's just good for you to feel pleasure. It doesn't get you something else. It doesn't get you coffee or jet skis or something like that. Pleasure is just good. That's what it is for something to be good as an end. It's just intrinsically good. It's not good for getting something else. The hedonist is someone who thinks that the one and only one thing that's good for a person as an end is pleasure. And the one and only one thing that's bad for a person as an end is pain. That's the hedonist theory. Here's something that's extremely important to note, and I can't possibly overemphasize this. Hedonism is not competing with utilitarianism. These aren't two different moral theories. They're not even answering the same question. Utilitarianism is a theory that answers the question, what should I do? What actions are right and what actions are wrong, morally speaking? Hedonism is not about action at all. It's not about what you should or shouldn't do. It's about what circumstances are good for an individual person. Okay, I had to sort of cram it in there at the end, but what is good for an individual person as an end? That's the question that hedonism is answering. And what is good for some one thing is just a very different question from what ought people do, right? Maybe what they do doesn't depend just on what's good for a single person. If you want to understand this question, just think about what people selfishly want or what they should selfishly want. Hedonism tells you what's selfishly good for an individual person. Now that might be different from what's the morally right thing to do. Maybe that person or some other people should do some things that will make this person worse off individually, selfishly, right? Hedonism just tells you what's good for one person. Okay. The next sub-theory or sub-thesis to utilitarianism is what we're going to call aggregation. Okay, this is aggregation. The theory that an outcome 
is better if the sum of what is good for each person minus what is bad for each person is greater. Okay, uh, what, what's going on here? Well, the first thing to notice is that this theory aggregation, it's answering a different question than utilitarianism is answering, and it's answering a different question than hedonism is answering. Aggregation is a theory not about individual people, but about whole outcomes, whole circumstances that involve lots and lots of people. Say that you are a hedonist. You agree. You, you think that, well, what's good for a person is just the most pleasure. Pleasure is the only thing that's good for a person, and pain is the only thing that's bad for a person. Say that you agree with the hedonist about that. Well, about what's good or bad as an end. Okay, so you agree about that, and then you want to know, okay, but there's more than one person. There are whole groups of people. How do you evaluate the goodness or badness of a whole situation, a whole scenario? Well, that's this question. What makes an outcome good, a whole outcome? Aggregation is one answer, and it says you add, addition. That's how you figure out how good or bad a whole outcome is. You've got how good or bad the outcome is for the individual people. Say you've got, you know, four people, and uh, they've got happiness or pleasure scores, right? And the first person gets a four amount of pleasure, right? And the next person gets a six, and the next person gets a negative two, because that next person, they have a little bit of pleasure, but they have a ton of pain, and the pain outweighs the pleasure. And then the last person gets, I don't know, a three or whatever, right? So you've got your four people. You know how good this scenario is for each person. Well, it's best for this person with the six, and it's worst for this person with the negative two, according to hedonism. If you want to figure out these numbers, you want to figure out how good things are for individual people, well, the only thing that you include in this calculation is the pleasure or pain. But what if you want to know how good or bad this situation is, not just for individual people, but all together? Aggregation says you just add them up. So 4 plus 6 is 10, minus 2 is 8, uh, plus 3 is 11. Okay, so this whole scenario, according to aggregation, is 11 points good, whatever that means, if you can, if you can quantify goodness, right? Um, if you can quantify pleasure or pain. And if you were to compare this to some other scenario, right, that was 4, 6, negative 2, and then just 2, then this would come out to 10, this scenario. And aggregation would therefore say that this situation is better than this situation. All you do is add. Notice that addition is not the only potential option. The aggregationist says addition is the way to go, but instead, maybe you think that the way to figure out how good a situation is, is to take the average. Or another option is to say that a situation is only as good as it is for the worst off person, right? So if there's someone who's at a negative two, according to this hypothetical competitor theory to aggregation, if someone is at a negative two, then that whole situation is at a negative two. And it doesn't matter how good it is for a few people, it's that worst off person that matters for how good the whole outcome or whole situation is. Okay, that's aggregation. Reminder, it's answering a different question than hedonism, which is answering a different question than utilitarianism. Hedonism is a theory about what's good for people. Aggregation is a theory about what's good for whole outcomes or whole situations. And utilitarianism, well, that's a theory about what to do, not about how good something is, but about what's the right thing to do. Now, I haven't explained yet how these fit into utilitarianism. I said before that they're sub-theses or sub-theories of utilitarianism. We'll get to that in a sec. Before that, we need the third component, the third sub-theory of utilitarianism. Okay, consequentialism. That's the third sub-thesis 
or sub-theory of utilitarianism. It says, we are morally required to do what produces the best outcome. Notice, consequentialism is phrased, at least at the start, similarly to how utilitarianism is phrased, right? They're both theories about what we are morally required to do. Morally required to do. They are both answers to the same question. And that question is this. What should we do? So consequentialism, just like utilitarianism, is a moral theory. It's just that consequentialism is a rather more vague moral theory, and utilitarianism is a more specific version of consequentialism. You have a choice. You have to make a decision about how you're going to behave. Are you going to attend some event that you promised to attend, or are you going to stop on the way to, I don't know, do some drugs that you like doing? or something like that, right? This is the decision that you have to make. Well, consequentialism says that the only thing that matters in deciding which is the right thing to do is what the results of your action will be. Maybe you promised to go to this event, but you really want to stop and do the drugs. Well, what are the outcomes of those various courses of action going to be, right? If no one is going to notice that you don't go to the event that you promised to go to, no one's going to notice that you break your promise, right? It's not going to eat away at you inside. It's not going to make you break more promises in the future. Well, then maybe the best outcome is for you to stop and do the drugs. I mean, you know, so long as doing those drugs don't have some terrible outcome themselves. If that's the case, then consequentialism says, you are morally required to stop and do drugs instead of going to this event, whatever it is that you promised to do. Now that's a somewhat fanciful scenario, but the point is just that according to consequentialism, it's the outcome that matters. And there's going to be lots of competitors to consequentialism. And we're going to talk about uh, at least two of those prominent competitors later in the course. Notice though that this is pretty vague because we don't know what the best outcome is. We don't know what makes an outcome good and what makes an outcome bad. So even if we went through all of the philosophical arguments and we convinced ourselves that consequentialism was correct, it was the correct moral theory. What we should do is the thing, what we must do is the thing that produces the best outcome. We're then left with the question, okay, well, which is the best outcome? That moves us to this question. We bought into this theory, now we have to answer this question. Aggregation is one answer to that question. It says, you wanna figure out what's, what makes an outcome good. Just figure out what makes it good for individual people and then just add it up. You don't privilege some people over others, you just add it all up. You just find the sum. Well, that's a good theory, maybe that's right. Maybe addition is the right way to go which is what aggregation says. Well, in that case, we want to know what exactly is it that we're adding? Well, we're adding the goodness and the badness for each person. Okay, well, what's good or bad for a person? You want to answer that question? Here it is. What is good for an individual person as an end, not merely as a way to getting something else? Well, hedonism is the answer to that. And hedonism says what's good for individual people is pleasure. And what's bad for individual people is pain. So you see, this is a moral theory, but it's a vague one. And in order to make it more specific, we need to answer this question. And that's what aggregation does. But even this theory is somewhat vague about what's good for an individual person. So in order to make this theory that we're building more specific, we need to answer this question. And hedonism is an attempted answer to that one. And you could mix and match all of these. You could be a consequentialist. You could think that what makes an action good or bad is the outcome, the result of that action. But then you might think that the right way to tell how good an outcome is is to, you know, pick the tallest person in that outcome and see how good the outcome is for the tallest person. That would be a competitor theory to aggregation. And then 
even if you took that sort of theory or aggregation, you're still going to need an answer to this question, and there's all sorts of other answers other than hedonism. We're going to talk about alternatives to all these theories in the next few weeks. The point is just this. If this is how you answer each of these questions, then you get utilitarianism. Here, let me prove it. Here's what utilitarianism says. Utilitarianism is the theory that we are morally required, okay, so it's an answer to this question, we're morally required to do whatever produces. It's about the product. That shows us that utilitarianism is a version of consequentialism. The only thing that matters is the product or the outcome or the result of some action, not anything else about that action, like whether it follows the moral law or something like that written down somewhere. That doesn't matter to utilitarianism, and that doesn't matter to consequentialism. All that matters is the product, so produces. That's consequentialism. The theory that we are morally required to do whatever produces the greatest total. The total, the total of something minus something else, that's the sum. That's addition. That's aggregation. And it's the greatest total of what? Pleasure minus pain. That's hedonism, pleasure and pain. Utilitarianism is the combination of these three sub-theories, which are all answers to different questions. Hedonism, aggregation, and consequentialism. Whew. Okay, now we have just one more thing to do, which is to quickly go back into the text by Bentham that we read for today and see where he states these sub-theories or sub-theses. By the way, he's, he's not really going to state this one in the part that we read for today, but he is going to give a statement of these two, which, you know, sort of add up to utilitarianism, which he states in the form of the principle of utility. Okay, this is something that Bentham says in section four of what we read for today. The community is a fictitious body. Oh, I've underlined the words that he italicizes in the original text. The community is a fictitious body composed of the individual persons who are considered as constituting, as it were, its members. Okay, so the community, whatever that is, a group of people or whatever, um, is something made up out of the individual people. It's a collection of people. The interest of the community then is what? The sum, oops, I miswrote this. It's uh, the sum, delete that, the sum of the interests of the several members who compose it. Okay, which theory is this? Which sub-thesis of utilitarianism is Bentham stating right here? Okay, pick one. It's one of these three. And actually, a minute ago, I just said that he doesn't state consequentialism, so you can even cross this one out. Which of these two, then, is he stating right here? Did you get it? it it's aggregation. Right? This is a statement of what's in the interest of the community. What's good for a whole group? Well, that is similar to, in the relevant respect, what makes an outcome? An outcome involving lots of people good. What's good for a whole group of people, according to Bentham right here, is you take the interests of the several members who compose that group, and you, you what? You add them. You find the sum. That's aggregation. The theory that an outcome is better if the sum of what is good for each person minus what is bad for each person is greater. This is the statement of the version of something like aggregation that we get in the reading. And here's something else that he says in the very next paragraph, in the very next section, which is section 5 in the, the bit that we read for today. Okay, Bentham says, It is vain to talk of the interest of the community without understanding what is the interest of the individual. Okay, what's that? That sentence is this arrow right here, right? That sentence is the move from aggregation to not yet hedonism, but some answer to this question, right? We've got an account right here 
of what makes a whole outcome good for a whole group of people, right? It's just the sum, the total of how good that outcome is for everyone. You just add them all up, that's aggregation. But then, Bentham says, it is vain to talk of the interest of the community. It's, it's, it's frivolous or in vain to talk about what's good for a whole group of people without understanding what is the interest of the individual, without knowing what's good for an individual person, what's good or bad for individual people, right? What is good for an individual as an end? So now he said, we need an answer to this question. And he's gonna give us that answer, his answer, in the next sentence. A thing is said to promote the interest or to be for the interest of an individual. Okay, here's what's good for a person, here it comes when it tends to add to the sum total of his pleasures, or what comes to the same thing, to diminish the sum total of his pains. What's good for a person, and that's it, the only thing that's good for a person is pleasure, and the only thing that's bad for a person is pain. This is the closest we get in Bentham, at least in the thing that we read for today, to a statement of hedonism. And it's pretty close to hedonism as we're going to define it and understand it in this course. Okay, so all we've done today, we haven't gotten any arguments. All we've done today is get an introduction of the theory that Bentham is going to defend. It's the theory that what makes an action good or bad is just how that action influences the total of pleasure minus pain of all the people everywhere. That's utilitarianism, and we saw how it's made up out of these three parts. What's gonna happen in the next few weeks of the course is we're going to, we're gonna see some attacks on each of these theories. And we're gonna notice that these arguments against utilitarianism, they hone in on just one of these three sub-theses. And so by noticing that these attacks on utilitarianism are really attacks on one of these three, we can see that utilitarianism maybe could be modified or changed into a different theory where you keep some of this, but you get rid of other parts. Okay, but before we get to the attacks, that's coming in the next few weeks of the course, we should say something about what's good about utilitarianism, why it's an attractive theory in the first place. And there are four things. There's four things about utilitarianism that make it an interesting, attractive moral theory. The first is that it provides an independent test for received moral wisdom, right? You get some moral teaching from your parents or your grandparents or your preacher or someone like that. Utilitarianism is a test that you can apply. If it's the right test, that's a separate question, but it's good at least that it's an independent test that you can apply to those moral claims, that moral wisdom that you get from other people to see if it's really moral, right? This doesn't depend on the fact that your parents or grandparents or preacher or president or whomever made these moral claims, tried to give you this moral wisdom. That's the first thing that's attractive about this as a moral theory. The second thing that's attractive about it is that it gives us a straightforward test. It's an easy test to apply to moral claims, the moral claims that you get. All you have to do is figure out, and this part might be a little bit difficult, figure out how much pain or pleasure results from various actions, and then you just sort of, as it were, do the math. So it's a rather straightforward test to apply. The third thing that makes utilitarianism an attractive moral theory is that it renders a verdict on any potential action. It's not just like some moral theory that's made up of a few laws that say do this or don't do that. Those kinds of theories, the theories that are made up of some specific commandments, they're gonna render judgments on certain actions, but there's gonna be other actions that have nothing to do with those commandments, nothing to do with what's mentioned in those commandments, that they're just gonna throw up their hands and not be able to give you an answer as to whether those are morally good or morally bad. Utilitarianism, in theory, can render a judgment about the goodness or badness, the rightness or wrongness of any possible action. For any action, 
there are going to be some outcomes. And those outcomes might be significant, they might affect lots of things, or they might affect very, very few things. But for any outcome, you can just try to measure what the total of pleasure minus pain is for everybody that results. And so if you can do that, utilitarianism is going to give you an answer as to whether that action is good or bad. And the last advantage that utilitarianism has is that the three subtheses that it rests on are all plausible. Pain and pleasure are pretty good candidates of the things that are good for people as an end. The jet ski theory of what's good for a person as an end is very implausible, right? Because jet skis are just kind of obviously only good for riding. Right? It's not just good to have jet skis locked away somewhere where you never get to see them and you never get to ride them. That's not good for you if you have a jet ski like that. But pleasure, if you just have pleasure, that seems to be just good for you. So hedonism is plausible. Aggregation is plausible. Aggregation says that the pleasure or pain of anyone counts equally. You just add them up. You don't privilege one person's pleasure or pain over anyone else. That's part of aggregation. Aggregation is plausible. And consequentialism, at least on the surface, consequentialism is plausible. What determines whether an action is good or bad is, well, what happens as a result of that action? All of that counts in favor of utilitarianism. And in the next few weeks, we're going to see some points that count against utilitarianism. Okay, is my voice still here? Yeah, okay.